The QMJHL New Brunswick Round Robin Series is over. We'll give our thoughts. The NHL North Division's heating up. We have a lot to say about what's going on. And there's a lot of drama coming out of Green Bay right now. What's happening with Aaron Rodgers? You're not going to want to miss that conversation. It's Sports Corn TV. Hey, everybody, what's going on? It's another episode of Sports Corn TV with Chris Dobson and Jerry Green. We're doing everything we can to keep you up to date with as much sports knowledge as we can. Jerry, we've got a lot to talk about, but first, man, how are things up in Miramichi? Well, the sun's shining, and we're here into May, Chris, and we just finished the hockey season for the Moncton Wildcats and the St. John Sea Dogs. So uh, let the spring begin, and, and there's still lots of meat on the bone to talk about in regards to that play down. Absolutely, and we're talking about the Moncton Wildcats and the St. John Sea Dogs and the Acadie Bathurst Titan. The play-in, the round robin has completed. The Acadie Bathurst Titans were the round robin champions coming out. They are going to face the Charlottetown Islanders. Uh, where do we start here, my friend? I mean, what an interesting journey and experience this has been for us to cover. You know, it's been a lot of fun for us to be behind the microphone up in the broadcast booth covering all these games. I mean, are you surprised? First and foremost, are you surprised that Bathurst was the champion that was crowned? I'll have to admit, no, Chris, I'm not. But uh, the way it happened, I certainly was. Um, uh, I had expectations. Just certainly hoped Moncton was going to win some games. But to make that last three games, that last weekend, to mean so much was all because of the Moncton Wildcats and their ability to come back over and over again. And to do so, and I'm going to say it again, with a, a, a rookie lineup, a, a lineup that had some call-ups, affiliate players called up, and a lot of rookies that have been the lineup since – the get-go. But what I did notice about those rookies, uh, Chris, is they seem to have taken on the personality of their captain and maybe perhaps their coach. It was never say die. Didn't matter what the score was. If the other team had come back on them, uh, they were ready to come back again. They seemed to be very resilient. Everything seemed to roll off their back. Okay, yeah, they scored. Let's go us. We'll, we'll go score too. And it was just incredible to watch. And, and then to force that last weekend where you had Bathurst really had the advantage by having those two home games, and but they got pushed right to the brink. I mean, St. John coming back to force overtime on that Friday night game, and then Moncton going to double overtime and had some great chances to win, Chris, made it a really lot of fun. And even the last game, St. John and Moncton still played, played for real and really wanted to conclude their season with a victory. So the whole weekend, this past weekend, to see who was going to represent the Maritime North was really, really fun. I mean, I think if we had him here, I would love to ask him. I would have to think that's got to be Ben Allison's biggest goal he's ever scored in the history of his career, uh, sending Akadi Bathurst, you know, to that final, which at that point did make that Sunday game a little, I'm not going to say not important because at the end of the day, they were saying goodbye to their 20-year-olds. Like, the game was still important in that aspect, but there was no... There was no prize at the end of the tunnel, if you know what I'm saying. So overall, I do say this, though, and I mean, you say you weren't shocked. I'm actually surprised i mean bathurst is good they made some great moves coming in i mean and to think they did this too i mean nick melanson got suspended deep into that series as well so i didn't know how that was going to go but jackson bellamy played you know scored some pretty big goals for bathurst as well i mean a local new brunswick guy was traded and acquired by acne bathurst at the trade deadline to bolster that blue line and he's and he did just that but what surprises me and i will say this i saw uh the across the line interview you guys had done and you brought up a good point and 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 you know, you said this to me on camera and off the air and everything as well. And that was the one thing that stood out was the fact that the Moncton Wildcats had a bona fide, solidified leader on that roster and Jacob Hudson. And I mean, everybody knows we pumped his tires in the broadcast, which was a lot of fun. And Jacob's been great to all of us. But overall, the fan support on the ice, off the ice, everything he does, he is the the definition of a prime leader in our organization. Yeah. But in St. John and Bathurst, what I found was surprising is you were bang on. I didn't see anybody jump up and take the reins. And that surprised me because on paper, I had St. John winning the whole thing. I won't lie. Yeah, on paper, both the uh, Bathurst and St. John, talent-wise, uh, you know, Trump, uh, Miramich, or Trump the Moncton Wildcats by a, a landslide. Um, right. But I've always said, you know, if if you if you uh, if you work working hard can beat talent if talent doesn't work hard, and um, I just found that the level of and even even the last game, Chris, where Moncton came out flat. And we're down three nothing, and you and I looked at each other and rolled our eyes and said, "What are we in for tonight? This is the last right. night, and we're going to be in for a lopsided a game." No, one thing came right back and said, "Okay, you guys scored three. We're ready to play now," and went back and, and did it themselves. 
But the excitement that the last weekend brought was the most fun of this round, Rob, and that those three, those two games in Bathurst where both teams went in and pushed the Titan to the, to the brink um, was just true entertainment and true drama. And the fact that Moncton went in there and really had some chances, Chris, to win in overtime and in double overtime was impressive. But now they're getting Bathurst on the second game, and they had just gone to overtime with St. John to give the, the Titans right. some credit. But you got to give a lot of credit uh, to the Moncton Wildcats and how fun they made that. So now here, Bathurst has to go on and play Charlottetown. Chris, Charlottetown's been down for, well, by the time they do get to play, which was announced, where they're going to play and when, uh, they're going to be down for three weeks. And here the Titan are fresh off the adrenaline of, of representing the North. What do you think is going to come of that? Well, one of two things is going to happen here. And that is, uh, you know, it might take a game for Charlottetown to get up and get ready to play. Uh, but at the same time, what's interesting to me, and we talked about it on the broadcast, because this is back when the questions were looming, where are they going to start this, the, the semifinals? Will it be in the Maritimes? Will it be in Quebec? Well, now we know it's going to be in Quebec. So not only have they had that uh, in regards to where they're playing, now they have it, the travels there. You are right. Bathurst is coming off a couple of heaters. Their guys are fresh. They're going to be able to, you know, they've, they've got legs, but Jim Halton's got his guys ready to go. There's, there's no doubt in my mind. You have a team of all-stars in the Maritime Division, the Charlottetown Islanders roster. I mean, all starting between the pipes. That is Colt Nellis, of course. He's your guy. You got Lucas Cormier. I mean, there's so, and I could go on and on. The list goes on, Jerry. I mean, they right. acquired, they made some big moves. But one of two things, that's what I mentioned. One, they're going to come out. It might take them a game or so. I don't see any scenario where Bathurst wins a series here. Islanders fans deserve this. Uh, I've, in fact, if you go back for the last few years, Jerry, Charlottetown Islanders fans or Charlottetown Islanders as a team, if you remember, every time the year starts, it's always they're the team to watch. Um, mm -hmm. And it goes back to the Daniel Sprong era and everything took place. That every year it was something, something, something. We're going to make the moves. But yeah, I can't see any scenario. I, I, I'm, I'd love to see Bathurst come out and make this series competitive. If they can score, you know, if they can get game one, maybe game two out quick and early, maybe you catch Charlottetown on their heels. Can't see it, but that's just my opinion. Well, it's a best of five short series. And I give a lot of value to the fact that the Titan have been in the pressure cooker already. Absolutely. And I've said this to you before, you know, the Charlottetown Islanders have been playing Halifax and have been playing Cape Breton and at times, you know, challenged themselves and got behind in some games to see if they could come back. They were toying, you know, I apologize or, or God bless the, the Mooseheads and the Eagles, um, but they were toying with them and because they were a of much course. better team than, than the two teams that they were playing. So I really want to see where the, how the switch gets snapped on and how they get ready to play. They've been practicing, but haven't been playing for three weeks. They're going to play in Shawinigan. Both teams are going to travel and play in Shawinigan in a series that's uh, going to get underway on Saturday and Sunday. They're both going to be afternoon games. They're going to be 4 p.m. Eastern time games, so 5 p.m. Our, our time. And then they'll go Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday in a best of five there, while the other series will also get underway um, this week, too, starting on Friday. But, of course, it, Blainville was the last team to get in. They're going to play Victor, but it was interesting from the Quebec uh, rollout Chris, that really everyone in the top six advanced. So there was definitely a cut off there, except a number three seed. I said this to you before. The number right. three seed, which was Shawinigan, gets bounced by the number 10, Ramuski. And we've seen that how many times where the number three seed in the overall standings gets bounced? Yeah, actually, as Wildcat fans, it hasn't even been that long since we've seen. I mean, yeah, you're absolutely bang on right there. Um, but one of the things I want to talk about, too, if we're before we move on to our thoughts on the Quebec portion, there's one piece of this whole Charlottetown Bathurst series. And I know that I was pumping Colton Ellis's tires in this conversation. That's not me taking a shot at either Chad Arsenal or Bednar as well. I mean, either one of those goaltenders are very capable, Jerry, of stealing you a couple games. And when the postseason starts, a hot goaltender can take you anywhere you want to go. I was looking at some of the numbers here. So Bednar, of course, has been the guy. He's played four games so far for Bathurst. He's sitting at a 2.75 goals against at a 919 save percentage. Now, Colt Nellis hasn't seen a postseason game yet. I mean, they, this, you know, this will be his first series coming into it. But if you go back to the regular series, the regular season, and I want to make sure I get these numbers right because I was looking at it earlier, and that he led the league. And again, he played more games, but he led the league. He's got 24 games played. Uh He's sitting at a 1.78 goals against at a 926 save percentage. Now, again, this is all coming back to the fact that you said you're right. They beat up on Halifax. They beat up on Cape Breton. Uh, you know, it's going to pad your numbers just a little bit. He had seven shutouts, Jerry. Mm -hmm. Seven in the regular season. I mean, 
I can't wait. These two goaltenders are very capable of going that route, and, and I'm, I'm so fired up for it. I can't wait for the series to start. So anyway, sorry to backtrack, but let's get into the Quebec portion. You are right. You talked about the, the threes and the tens. Other than that Ramuski, like other than that Ramuski upset, was there one that really, like, was there anything else that surprised you? Yeah, I was, I was surprised at the ease that uh, Quebec eliminated Drummondville. That's number six versus number seven, and that's usually a tough series no matter, you know, what, uh, when you have two, two teams that close in the standings, playing each other usually it goes to the limit so I was a little surprised by that and on top of that they were playing the games all the games in Drummondville and Quebec sweeps through them now the next series sets up real good because you know who Quebec's playing Shakutami and both of those regions hate each other not hate is a strong word but there's always been a competition between those two Rune Rand is going to Rune Rand is going to play Ramuski and I guess Ramuski would have one of the hottest goaltenders in Creed Jones Chris hold on to your hat on this I know he goes three and two in that series versus Shawinigan and wins losses, but 2.68 goals against and a 9.16 save percentage. And hold on to your hat again, Chris. Ramuski scored 10 goals in those five games and wins the series three games to two. Uh, Shawinigan had scored 13 goals. So uh, that's that's just astounding to me. Uh, uh, Creed Jones, who was with the St. John Sea Dogs, is now back in Ramuski, where he originally originally came from before he went to St. John, and he uh, seems to be carrying them in the postseason. In a situation we're looking at right now, currently, and I know we had asked, I had asked you this a couple of weeks ago, and obviously things are changing here now. But do you see a scenario where somebody beats Val Dor in the postseason? Well, the only one you could, again, on paper, Chris, the only one that I could see legitimately would be Charlottetown. The Charlottetown has to get by Bathurst, and I think that will right. be close. Um, but Charlottetown would have the ingredients. That would be able to uh, challenge Valdor, but Valdor's got everything right. from the net out uh, in their favor. And now they've been sitting for a little while since they swept uh, through Bay Como. Uh, yep. They had a week or so off, uh, but that, that might just help them heal some wounds. But that's got to be the team led by Jacob Pelche and, of course, Jordan Spence. So th- they're a little bit of more fondness to us in regards to uh, uh, wishing them the best. But I think Charlottetown will could and will uh, perhaps represent the Maritimes very proudly. Well, Jerry, as always, I love our breakdown. I love our thoughts of the QMJHL. Let's stick with ice hockey, but change leagues. Starting with, we're going to go to the National Hockey League. Decision has come down on Tom Wilson. $5,000 fine for everything that took place with Buchnevich and Panarin. And I, before I give my thoughts and opinions, before I get thrown off television, what the hell is going on here? I mean, this, this is mind-blowing to me, Jerry. How... How is there no supplemental discipline? How is there a $5,000 fine for this clown who's done this repeatedly? How is he still in the league? The strange thing about it is, you know, they always talk about there being a code and they claim, well, Tom didn't take his gloves off. So he was taking it easy on it, but it's, it's Panarin who weighs maybe 190 pounds, maybe, maybe it's 180 and, and Wilson's got to be 230. And throwing him on, around like a rag doll. But yes, he didn't take his gloves off. But then to slam him onto the ice. And even if he did take Very offense. Very dangerous. Yes. Very dangerous. Even if he did take offense that Panarin jumped on him because of uh, punching his teammate. Panarin's a New York Rangers teammate that was down on the ice. Still, he just had to look who the opponent was. And, and why are you manhandling Panarin? And then sitting on top of him, if you notice, Panarin's down and, and Wilson's skates are right in his face. Uh, yep. Once he sits on top of him, very, very dangerous. But I think the NHL's taken the perspective. Well, it wasn't, it was just a regular scrum that you always see in hockey. And that the fact that, that Wilson was so much stronger than Panarin, well, that's just the way it goes. That's what it seems like the point of view is here. No. And if you look at some of his previous suspensions, I mean, his last one was a 14 game suspension back in 2018, five previous suspensions before that. But I want to read a statement. So when the, when the ruling came out, the New York Rangers put out an official statement. And I want to make sure I get the quote right. And that is the New York Rangers are extremely disappointed that the Capitals forward, Tom Wilson was not suspended for his horrifying act of violence last night at Madison square garden. Wilson is a repeat offender with a long history of these types of acts. And we find it shocking that the national hockey league and the department and the department of player safety failed to take the appropriate action to suspend him indefinitely. Wilson's dangerous and reckless actions caused an injury to Artemi Panarin that Mm -hmm. will prevent him from playing again this season. We view this 
as a dereliction of duty by the NHL head of player safety, George Peros, and believe he is unfit to continue in his current role. The Rangers are calling for George Peros to be removed because of this decision, and I don't blame them for it one bit. I think this guy should be thrown out of the league. He's, uh, he's Bush League. He doesn't belong here. And then he was flexing in the box. No, the antics, the antics were even Get more frustrating. Here. But um, even if it, even it had to be the rest of the regular season, there had to be games, not money. I mean, five thousand dollars to a uh, a professional athlete is an, is a is a, a very a very light blood. slap on the wrist. But the 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 actions and and the anger that he had towards uh, the couple of the smaller players for the for the New York Rangers was really absurd. And, and uh, I really don't want to talk about him too much more. I do want to talk about Chris, the North division and specifically what the Montreal Canadians are starting to do and what the Winnipeg jets aren't doing. Jets aren't winning. Montreal Canadians are. Let me pose this question to you, Chris, if Montreal was able to uh, pull ahead of the Winnipeg jets, are you more comfortable with them playing the Oilers? Are you more comfortable playing the Toronto Maple Leafs? The Edmonton Oilers. In less than two minutes, you're going to answer that. Oh, the Edmonton Oilers. Now, let me tell you this. Why do you pick the Oilers on that? Uh, I saw, a, I'll sum it up perfectly. I saw a great interview with Josh Anderson the other day, and he talked in regards to the difference between the Toronto Maple Leafs and the Edmonton Oilers. Um, this quote was taken out of context on social media, and it actually stirred a lot of controversy. But what he was saying was, is when you're playing the Edmonton Oilers, you're playing Connor McDavid on one line versus Leon Dreisaitl on another line. When you're playing the Toronto Maple Leafs, you're playing Austin Matthews and Mitch Marner. Then you got Nylander and Tavares. Like you're, you're star-studded, you're stacked. If you can keep those players in check, and Montreal's proven they can do a good job against Connor McDavid, um, you know, it's going to come down to goaltending. And ultimately, I think Montreal wins that series probably well, about five. The numbers do bear true, Chris, because uh, Montreal is five and two versus Edmonton this season. And there's two games left. And they're at home versus Edmonton coming up uh, the last weekend of the season conversely against toronto they're three and five they got two games left against toronto this week and both of them in toronto so your instincts are correct montreal has played very well in edmonton and they played very well at home in the seven games they've won five so if they have a seven game series with edmonton they're gonna win four aren't they but they, it's interesting to see and, and of course you know i'm gonna have to ask you because i don't know if you have the jersey yet on Caulfield, who's Scored two overtime goals for the Montreal Canadiens to help them in their winning ways. First player in NHL history to score his first two goals in back-to-back overtime games. Number one. Two, answer your question. Yes, Jersey was ordered the minute he took his pre-skate on his first game. Not here yet. Otherwise, it would be right there. So I'm so showing some support for Jonathan Drouin right now. He needs mm-hmm. all the love we can give him. Uh, but yeah, no, uh, everything's clicking. The only thing that's weird for me right now is watching Montreal play the way they're playing without key pieces in their lineup. No Byron, no Tatar, no Shea Weber, no Brendan Gallagher, no Carey Price, and they're finding ways to win. Is it Cole Caulfield? Is it the effect bringing some young? I mean, Jake Evans has looked great. Lekkonen's looked great. Playing him with Caulfield and the kids is perfect today. As of Tuesday, that's today. While we're recording, he was actually Caulfield was getting some first line time too. So uh, Petrie's had taken on some more responsibility. And I think sometimes if he takes the back seat behind a Webster Weber, I don't think he's as, as effective as if they give him the the leading role. So, but Montreal has been the most uh, newsworthy uh, team here in the last week or so in that North Division, where Winnipeg has not been. Winnipeg's losing the teams like Ottawa, and again, I don't know how many times I've seen it this year, Chris, where. Winnipeg's in a tie with a few uh, a minute or less in the hockey game and end up right. losing, get scored on, don't even get a point. So they're they're frustrating the heck out of me. But you know, it was a, it was a few months ago, Chris, that I was really wondering whether Edmonton was ever going to make the playoffs, and here they are sitting uh, sitting uh, in second Clinched. place, Clinched. and and they've got Connor McDavid um, possibly going to hit a hundred points, which is very rare for or very uh, very uh, impressive for fifty six games. Kid's a freak. Um, but before, yeah, kid's a freak. Uh, Connor McDavid's the real deal. But again, everybody knows that. I don't want to, I, we don't need to talk about Connor McDavid, Jerry. Everybody knows he's a superstar. I have one Jets question for you before we move on from the National oh, Hockey God. League. And that is, no, no, it's just, it's a general question. Everybody on social media and online now are calling for Paul Maurice's head on this whole situation. What are your thoughts? I'm putting my hand up. I, okay. I'll, I'll second that opinion. He's Perfect. been there. Um, and he, look, he's a great coach, but I can see. I can see the uh, uh, the system that he has in, 
and it seems like the players are getting tired of it. They're getting very sloppy. They're getting very tired, and and I think that's what you need. You need a refresher there. You need a new look. Uh, he's been there and done some great things. It took him all the way to the conference final and lost to Vegas, and Vegas went on to the Stanley Cup, but uh, that was the one year. I think it was 2017, Chris, and now this is 2021, and nothing's gone right for the Jets in regards to regular season or playoffs since, so I think I think that's accurate, then, and I think you might see a change in the offseason. All right. Well, let's switch to the gridiron because there's a lot of drama happening yes. in cheesehead country. Um, Aaron Rodgers, this drama that's surrounding, uh, you know, the Green Bay Packers announced there is no way we're trading Aaron Rodgers. 20 minutes later, Schefter reports Aaron Rodgers wants this told players he wants out of Green Bay. Is there a situation or a scenario where you see Aaron Rodgers not starting for the Green Bay Packers this year? I read an interesting piece the other day about who really needs a quarterback. And it was, it seemed to focus on Denver and the Las Vegas Raiders are two teams that could possibly, and Denver being a prime one. I think the Niners but, would look good for Aaron Rodgers too. But yes, but then they just drafted the young kid, Chris, and, and it just didn't seem like they had a focus on maybe the opportunity of getting Rodgers. But yes, it is Trey a possibility. Lance. Trey but Lance, it, yes, they drafted Trey Lance. Lance. Um, but I do not blame uh, Aaron Rodgers for maybe flexing a, a request to be traded. And I go back to that, that, that conference game with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and they took the ball out of his hands. I think that was a slap in the face. And whether it was an intentional or not or subliminal, it was a slap in the face. Do you remember the play? And they settled for the field goal and they never got the ball back. Why do you, you take didn't... the balls out of the, of the MVP's hands? I think that was a slap. And I think that sat with him. He hasn't said anything. But I think it's really sat with him. And if there's an opportunity, if he can request a trade, I think he, he, he will and is going to leave. Well, we talked about it a couple of weeks ago. I mean, your boy was hosting Jeopardy at one episode, and that was one of the questions that was during Final Jeopardy. That was yes. one of the contestants actually wrote that. Whose decision making was it to, 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 on that play? <laughs> and he laughed it off. He chirped it a little bit. And he's like, I, I don't know who it was. Um, but overall, I mean, yeah, no, I, I fully agree with you. You look at the guys who need a quarterback. And the only reason I suggested the Niners, yes, they drafted Trey Lance. But they're in a win now situation. And, you know, Aaron Rodgers, let's be real. I don't know how much time he's got left in the National Football League, but how great of a mentor would he be in, you know, if Aaron Rodgers is the quarterback for the San Francisco 49ers, I can tell you right now, they're instantly, in my opinion, they are strong enough and deep enough that they could potentially go toe to toe with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And with the uh, draft being held this week, they talked about, and we'll get onto the draft here in a second, but um, the Grand, uh, uh, Green Bay's history in the draft in the last 10 years never got Rodgers any offensive weapons. They acquired the offensive weapons, but never drafted an offensive weapon or even an offensive lineman. It was always defense, defense, defense. So uh, that's something he could take offense to as well. But I do take offense to, to watching the commissioner of the NFL hug everybody that comes onto the stage and that Isn't he's that their ridiculous? best friend. He's their best friend. And I, I always thought the, the uh, NFL Players Association hated the commissioner, but uh, these new guys don't know yet, I guess. Well, yeah, maybe not. I mean, it's not like he's Gary Bettman, but uh, no, but you're absolutely right. Uh, it's, it's crazy to me that, you know, and again, this guy's going to get all these kids paid. Don't kid yourself. Mm -hmm. But overall, just to watch him do what he does standing on stage, it, I, I, it's laughable to me. And the NBA Absolutely does it too, Chris. I think the NHL does it right. You want the representatives from the teams come up. And you remember the time Bobby Clark forgot Claude Giroux's name and he had to look <laughs> over and said, who are we getting? And then that, that's, that's humorous stuff. And, I, uh, and it gives a little bit more of a personal touch for each team rather than having a commissioner from the NBA or the NFL up there uh, taking all the limelight. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, overall, I mean, did, were, were any of the placements of the draft pick, did, any, did anyone surprise you? Did, you? did anybody fall further than you thought they were going to go? No, I don't really follow that closely, Chris. I, I just okay. I get overwhelmed with the fact that the, it's, it's quarterback, 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 quarterback. Everybody wants a quarterback. Was, was there no good? Even, even, even uh, 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 Palmer, um, um, uh, the Chicago Bears drafted a quarterback, and they, they, uh, they had uh, uh, what's-his-name come to them, and then, and then the Pats got a quarterback. You know, the Pats are going to be – that quarterback's going to be good for them. Mac and Jones, I think man. he's the Al – yeah, the Alabama quarterback, and I guess Saban and, and, and uh, um, Balachek are good friends. And so they would have talked about it and said that would be a great pick for you. And he's an another, intelligent player, and that's perfect for the Patri Patriots. Another slow Caucasian quarterback for the New England Patriots. And now I just <laughs> – hey, like I said, you saw the draft stories and the, the analysis – 
when Tom Brady first came into the league, look, people want to know, can New England win with him? Yeah, I think they can. I mean, Belichick's proven that in a Bill Belichick system, if you're willing to play the game, good things can happen. But either way, it was exciting. Hey, it is what it is. The draft is over. I think the Colts are going to be a lot better next year. Uh, here we go. Yeah. No, no, no. We have only got like 25 <laughs> seconds, so I don't have time to go into it before we hit the wrap here. But overall, I'm excited for football season to get underway. Uh, you know, I, I don't even know. Yeah, I don't. I've all caught signs of emotions. I think and there's no scenario where Tampa Bay doesn't repeat this well, year. Well, hopefully That's the CFL. Hopefully the CFL gets a, it gets underway this year too. We'll keep our fingers crossed, and hopefully fans can go and watch. Okay, Jerry, that's it. It is time. Everyone's favorite part of the show. We're going to the wrap, and we're going to start with right now for the second year in a row, the NBA is doing yeah. a play-in round again. What are your thoughts on the play-in round? Well, like it start- yes, it started with the bubble, and now they've got it again this year. I think it's added extra intrigue. I'm watching maybe a few more Raptor games, even though it looks like the Raptors don't want to get in. In the East and the West, there's a challenge to see who's going to get to the second round and what other or the first round, rather, whatever also intrigues me, if that the L.A. Lakers and uh, LeBron James don't like it, that makes me even like it more because LeBron James has been injured and they've had some injuries where they're falling in the standings. They could get in the play-in, and that would be a lot of fun. Seattle Kraken, Chris, officially with the NHL. What's their first step? Hiring a coach. Uh, I would think you hire a coach. The expansion draft is just around the corner. There were some blogs and some websites out there posting that possibly Gerard Gallant, Kirk Muller could be on the list. But if you're asking me, you got to start now that they've made their final payment, they're in the league, they can sign players, but you got to go with the coach first. Jerry, uh, Major League Baseball, 30 games into the season. What are your impressions so far? I'm enjoying the Jays. They're hovering and above 500, and they're in the top three in the in the American League East. I'm loving that. I'm loving watching that Western division in the National League. The, the Dodgers have picked up some injuries, and the Giants and the Padres are challenging them for the, the top spot. And then in the National League East, You've got a bunch of teams that are hovering around 500. Nobody really wants to take control of the National League. He's baseball back, and I'm really enjoying it. From the boxing world, Chris, what about what this Logan Paul and Floyd Mayweather, they're going to go into the squared circle. What's your observations? Well, the the fight's finally on. Uh, It's been pushed once or twice. I have two quick opinions on it. One, I think it's an absolute mockery of the sport, and I hope Logan Paul gets his block knocked off. Uh, I don't understand why Floyd Mayweather would take this fight. He's 50-0. I understand it's an exhibition but he's making fun of the sport. I understand that Logan Paul, he's a YouTuber, he makes money, he is a fighter. It it doesn't make sense to me. Uh, Everyone's in it for the dollars and cents. (laughs) Foolish, can't stand it. That's my thoughts on that. Guys, this has been another great episode of Sports Porn TV. I hope you love the show. I hope you love the rap. Chris and Jerry will be here every Thursday. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next week.